So we're going to talk about uh, the course management tools in depth. And uh, these tools were used to build the training course that we taught uh, together. Uh, so the three of us, Neil uh, and Robin and me, uh, last week on May 28th and 29th. So what's the agenda for today? <clears throat> so we'll mainly talk about the course management tool, but we'll also touch on the training course moving from Scala 2 to Scala 3. Then, okay, I start using acronyms. So I abbreviate course management tools to CMT to save some, uh, some space. Um, so we first uh, will explain why course management tools, right? And we'll talk about a solution that is often used, which I, which I call it naive, because you will soon understand why that is. And there's a more complete solution, and that's CMT. And then we'll finally wrap things up and talk about uh, what could be done next. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Neil, who's now going to give you uh, a short overview of what was done to uh, build this course using the course management tools. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, as, uh, as Eric said, I'll just give a, a really quick overview of one use of the course management tools that we've recently, um, we've recently experienced. Um, for my part, this is the first time I've, I've actually been introduced to the course management tools and having just done the first iteration of this uh, workshop moving from Scala 2 to Scala 3, um, I can really see its benefit and it's, it's actually quite a, quite a useful tool. Um, the workshop that I'm talking about, moving from Scala 2 to Scala 3, this was a workshop I think originally conceived of um, by Eric um, and the idea was to deliver it at this year's Scala days. But as we all know with the, the COVID-19, um, we've had to pretty much cancel all in-person uh, conferences um, and, and meetings and workshops. So rather than just letting the idea um, go to waste, um, I decided um, to continue with the development of the course. And he invited uh, Robin and myself to, to help to, to, to develop it, really, um, with the idea that, OK, if we can't deliver it in person, perhaps we can still uh, try to deliver something. First, the, the, the artifacts, so, um, as you see on the slide there, all the artifacts are open source, so the, the source code for the, app, the underlying application for the workshop, plus all the slide content. So the idea was that we, we could at least, even if we couldn't go ahead with the Scala Days workshop, we could at least uh, um, open source and, and publish and make available this workshop material. And then we decided actually we would do a delivery of the course internally only uh, to start with. Um, so we invited, um, some of, uh, of, of our own colleagues uh, in the Intertech. And we did a delivery um, last Thursday, last Thursday, Friday, 28th and 29th of uh, May, which I, I, I gather, I, I hope at least it was, um, um, the people benefited from it. We, we certainly, as uh, the instructors, we, we, uh, we really had a good time. Um, it was really engaging. So, um, just a quick um, uh, overview of what the, the course in terms of the application was. So it was based on, based on uh, um, an ACA application, uh, um, a, a Sudoku solver actually, um, that Eric had made and had used for other talks in the past um, to demonstrate um, various features of, of ACA, the ACA framework, um, clustering for demonstrating clustering and ACA type. So we decided to take this application um, and that actually permitted us to, to, um, to advance a lot more quickly. But um, we tried to simplify it a little bit, uh, we removed the, the clustering and we cleaned up the code a bit. Um, and we, you know, we, we took it from there and we took about six weeks to start from this application and then build all the material around it for, for the course. Um, so as I said, we did it on um, the 28th and 29th of May with um, some internal um, Lunatec people. You can see we have a recording of it actually, but even the recording itself is also for internal use only. So uh, maybe for, for now, uh, we won't share that um, more widely. 
hopefully um, we can uh, do a, another delivery for those uh, internally who weren't able to, to benefit. Um, but yeah, so in terms of what we do going forward, um, switch to the next slide. Um, in terms of what we plan for the upcoming, um, upcoming um, period, so the, you may or may not know, um, we say Scala 3, but we also use the word Dottie because Dottie, uh, because Dottie is the name of the project and I still think that's the, the most used. Um, but that is continuing to, continuing to evolve. Um, so we have to keep evolving the course to kind of meet the new evolutions of Dottie. So they release about every six weeks uh, a new, um, a new um, a minor version of, of, uh, of Dottie. So then we, we go through a process of updating to make sure that, the, that all the exercises still run, the application still runs. Um, if there are syntax, syntax changes or new um, things, new, new features, well, either at the level of the compiler, uh, certain new compiler flags. So we go through and try to make benefit of that. So it's a, it's a, it's a workshop, it's a course that is, is going to be evolving for the foreseeable future, at least until um, the, the, the first um, release candidates of, um, of Scala 3. So, um, so what we hope to do, in addition to just evolving to meet Dotty, um, new changes in Dotty, we are thinking of maybe doing another application. So we, as I said, we have a, an ACA based uh, Sudoku solver as the first application for the workshop. So we're hoping to do another one um, because we had some feedback from the course that uh, maybe ACA, an ACA type isn't, um, everyone isn't very familiar with it. So maybe we could try to use a, a different, um, kind of a different approach, a different application um, that maybe is more accessible. Uh, so that will give us a second set of exercises that we could use. And, um, and then here is actually some, where we, we would welcome some feedback, maybe from the guys who, who did the course, and maybe from others who have seen. If anyone has any ideas about the types of applications that would be useful to, to demonstrate, um, we, are, we are definitely all ears because um, it's not necessarily a, a, um, an easy thing to find because the application has to be, we don't want it to be too simple, not too trivial because then you can't show anything uh, useful, but it also can't be too complicated. So it can't be a, a real production application in that sense. Um, so finding a good use case where we can show good features of the language, um, with also a constraint that it shouldn't be too dependent on frameworks because that might make it a bit too complicated. Uh, so yeah, we are, we're definitely um, all, all open, to, uh, open to, to ideas there. Um, but yeah, this is basically was just to give a, a quick overview of the, the workshop, which was, as I said, the, the first opportunity to really, for, for Robin and myself uh, at least, uh, because obviously Eric, he, I think he, he knew a bit more about it before. But for us to really see the power of a, a tool like this, the course management tools for creating uh, training material. Um, so with that, I think I'll just pass it back to Eric. Um, yeah, thanks for, uh, for this overview, very useful. Um, so let's have a dive into the course management tools themselves. So first of all, um, you know, the, they are, um, they exist since a while, I created them uh, first time so around mid-2016. And um, shortly after that, uh, they were open sourced. And actually, I can quickly show you one second. So, sorry, I'm fiddling with the slides. If we, so there's a, I will uh, share the, um, the presentation after the, after this, uh, talk, uh, but this is the uh, repository. Uh, it's called Course Management Tools, obviously, and, um, you know, open source. So feel free uh, if you want to contribute uh, to them. So let's switch back to the presentation and let's see why actually course, the course management tools fit a need. Um, so if you try to maintain exercises uh, for a course, you have two kind of orthogonal requirements. First of all, in, in our dimensions, so in the first dimension, you have multiple exercises and you know the next one usually builds on top of the previous one. So there's like uh, an evolution that you need to maintain. 
But then secondly, that a series of exercises as a whole probably evolves over time. So you need to version it. So a naive approach uh, that I've used in the past and many people have used is to actually uh, put each and every exercise in, in a commit. And you would basically jump from one exercise to the next by checking out the next commit in the repository. So that's fine uh, if you never need to change uh, the content of your course. But suppose you have this is version 1.0 and you change something in exercise 5. Now you have to rewrite history, right? So you have to um, apply a change in 5 and as a consequence all the history, well, most of the history is rewritten. And that's not good, obviously, because it, it has a number of uh, real big disadvantages. Um, so you have to use um, something like what is called uh, interactive rebasing, which will constitute a steep learning curve for most people. So it's not a, a thing that is easy to apply uh, if all the thing, uh, the only thing you want to do is build a course. And um, so there's no real other alternatives, right? And that's uh, an, an, an associated problem with that is that if you make, uh, if you want to collaborate on a course and people do a PR, then as soon as you, as soon as you write, uh, rewrite history, PRs are basically uh, useless or invalidated. So how do, how to collaborate on a project? That is the, the big uh, key thing. And, um, you know, there are some kind of workarounds because when people build a new version of uh, a series of exercises, usually what they do is that they save the existing state on a branch and then duplicate that and, um, and, and, and move on uh, to work. But now the PRs and so on are, are basically isolated in, in a separate branch. So the course management tool, uh, uh, address this by using a different scheme uh, where um, the versions between different uh, editions of the exercises are just regular commits in a Git repository. And all the exercises can be edited um, individually at any one point in time. Um, so there there is a thing that, of course, that uh, interactive, the re interactive rebasing approach is still useful because if you uh, go back to the example where you have like 10 exercises and you, you change something in exercise five and exercise build, uh, six builds on top of exercise five, now um, you would have to apply those changes over and over again. So we'll get to that. There is a solution that is offered by the course management tools. Um, what we do is that uh, in this master repo and that I'll show you in a second, uh, we need, that will not be used by students themselves. What we will do is that the tooling can generate a so-called studentified repository, which is geared towards the student's um, use. So CMT consists of the following components. You have Studentify that I already explained. Uh, it's to generate the student artifact. Um, then there is Linearize and Delinearize, which is actually used to enable the interactive rebasing approach. And then there is a command that allows you to do some administrative tasks. So let's look at the individual details. So um, here's a, like a screenshot from an IDE where we actually have the, the structure of the course that we, that we built. So we have 11 exercises with an initial state. And if I switch to uh, my IDE, to Visual Code Studio, here is the project. And you see that uh, every uh, exercise is a project in a multi-project SBT built. And so every uh, project contains all the files in the state for that exercise. And if I go to the next exercise, some changes will uh, be applied to what is in exercise zero, 
uh, so that it leads to the situation in exercise one, et cetera, et cetera. So if we switch back to the presentation, um, this is what we have. And if we studentify the master repository, what we do is we launch a command and we create this artifact that will probably be zipped and then sent off to the student. And you see that um, when a student uh, downloads this uh, zip file, unzips it, CDs into the unzipped folder, fires up SBT, a number of extra commands are available for the student. And yeah, we can actually also make this a Git repository. Uh, this has some use cases uh, in specific, uh, specific situations. So these are the, ex um, these are the uh, commands that you have at your uh, disposal. But I propose that we just have a quick look that we actually generate um, the artifacts. So I have four windows here. At the bottom here, I'm in the course management tools. So I can actually, um, I can actually uh, generate um, the studentified artifact. So the command is studentify. I use uh, the dash dot because I'm generating a dot, doing it with a dot project. Um, I minus G means that I want it to be a Git repository. This is the folder that contains the master repository, and this is the folder that will contain the artifact. So this is the folder in which the artifact will be generated. It's currently empty. So if I execute the command, and I look here, now I have my uh, studentified repository. I just need to fire up SBT, and after SBT has loaded, I can um, have a look around. So I will be automatically positioned in the initial state. So a student can, uh, for example, get the main man page that contains instructions on what to do next. And there's also a um, exercise specific man page that gives instructions that the student can run. For example, it will tell in this case to um, uh, to run the tests and to execute the program. So if I run the tests, you know, that should uh, work clean. And after that's compiled, both the, the main code and the test code, all the tests pass. So now I can say, okay, list me all the exercises. And you see that there are you know, the 11 exercises where you see the star pointing to the current exercise, I can move around, I can go to the next exercise. And when I do that, actually, whatever, whatever I have in my, in my, you know, what I've written or either started from will not change, except that with next exercise, um, the tests for the next exercise will be pulled in from quote unquote, the solution. So then I, the student typically goes through the flow that, you know, they look at the instructions, then they code, and then, uh, you know, they end up by executing the tests again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also account for students that may not uh, able, be able to finish their exercise in time. So then usually the question comes, you know, I would like to look at what I'm missing later on. And what a student can do is say, save state. And now they can say, okay, I want to, uh, I need to move on. So I'll pull the solution. So now effectively they're in a known state where they can continue to the next exercise. So they do the next exercise. Um, they work, blah, 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 blah. And then when they get home, they can say, okay, saved states. And there is indeed, because I just saved it one saved state. And they can say, okay, restore uh, state, and they select the state, and voila, they're back to where they were. Uh, let's quickly show, uh, look at the uh, presentation, if there's anything I missed. I uh, guess that, yeah, you can also jump around at arbitrarily, uh, and you can also 
um, basically pull in individual files from the solution by using the pull template commands. So that's the functionality uh, for the student. I think, you know, one of the most important aspects of the course management tools. So then there's the question, how do you evolve uh, the exercises? And um, obviously in the master's project, and let's have a look at the master project. Um, we have, uh, let's see. Uh, you know, if I, for example, want to change something in the readme file of exercise six, then I just navigate to the file, I edit in place, and there you go. You know, I, you can change whatever you like. Now, <laughs> if there is this um, like uh, interactive rebasing kind of um, need, then what happens is that you would do something like this. You would start from the master repository, and then there is a command that will linearize this repository. And what it does is it turns this master repository into an artifact that is a Git uh, repository, where instead of having a uh, multi-project build with one project per exercise, you now have a commit per exercise. And you consider this a scratch pad, right? Uh, it's gonna be discarded, except for some specific use cases where it's not, but it's gonna be discarded after use. And then you can start evolving uh, the state of the exercise by doing interactive rebasing. So suppose we change exercise five, we do that, and the commits, you know, the, 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 the shahs of the commits changed. And we can do that as many times as you want. We can turn around here like 500 times. And each time you do that, you know, things will change and change and change. And after a while you say, okay, now I want to reflect what I've changed here. I want to reflect it back to the master repository. And that's done by a delinearize command. So delinearize will apply all the changes that are here back there. Once you're done, you basically delete this and you're finished. So uh, let's have a look. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. So with that, I would propose to hand it over to Robin. And Robin is going to give you a demonstration of uh, what I just described uh, on the exercises. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. So I'll give a, a quick demo on uh, uh, how uh, like we're using uh, delinearize and delinearize commands. So like, uh, as you can see, uh, like this is my uh, Visual Studio code. So, uh, so for example, I need to make some change in uh, this exercise. So this is one of the exercise in the middle. So for example, this, the seventh exercise. So, uh, so if you look at for something like, uh, yeah, so let's say uh, I need to make some change in this file. So uh, with this, how we can do, I'll, so I'll show. So the thing is the, um, Excess, if you look the exercise eight, nine, ten, all are the exact uh, copies of this one. So all files which contains in exercise seven will be there, plus some additional other lines of code. So if I make some change here, so I need to add that change in the subsequent exercises as well. So uh, so I'll show you how this tool can do it very quickly. So uh, this is my uh, master repository. So I have a command called linearize. Linearize, then I give it flag called dot to mention it is a dotty project. Then I copy the path of the master repo. Then, uh, yeah, so this is my target directory. So if you look at this, so it just uh, now it created a linearized repo. So now, uh, so 
So this is uh, the linearized repo. And uh, if you look at the git list block, So as Eric explained, uh, each commit is one exercise. So now I need to make some change in the seventh exercise. So what I have to do is I need to edit this particular commit. So how can I do is I can do a git rebase interactive starting from root. So I can select a particular commit to edit. So in my case, I'm going to edit the seventh exercise. I mentioned to edit that. So now I've started rebasing. And I can go back to my IDE. I want to, I can make whatever changes I need to do. So here, for example, I make some change in this file. So this is uh, like a kind of a dotis index. So it allows uh, us to re like, right in a more concise way. So I just uh, remove this part. I'm not uh, going to explain the Doty syntax, but it's uh, just to show how this tool helps me to perform this. So I made these changes in this file. And uh, so if, yeah, one change, I just add that change to my kit and uh, uh, that's all the change I needed to apply now. So I can finish the rebasing by get rebase, continue. So uh, one thing we need to uh, notice is uh, we are just editing that particular commit. So we have to keep that commit message as if, as is. so don't need to change that commit message, just keep that. So I've completed editing that. Now uh, I can perform the other way of delinearizing. So instead of linearize, I can give a command called delinearize. Uh, for this, I don't need this flag. So this is the, the first one is uh, the path to the master repo. And I need to specify the path to the linearized repo. So uh, I need to add this as well. Okay. So I just performed denaturalizing. So if this is, we go back to the master repo, let's check. So now you can see, I just made one change in a single file in exercise seven. So the same change is being applied to exercise seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. So uh, we can go back to uh, the master one and can see, I'm sorry, the changes. So the changes are there now in all those files, okay? so. Um, I finish with my editing, then I can normally add all those files and I can commit it. So let's say I exercise seven for now, just a simple message. So with this, I can further generate the studentified repository with the help of uh, this command called uh, studentify. So it's a Doty project. So the path to the master repo. And Let's say I have, yeah, let's take this folder as the target. Copy the path. So 
studentify minus dot, then the path to the master repo followed by the path to the target. So it generates a studentified repo. We can see that in action. So this is what the students get. So now it has all those uh, exercises and it, the student can perform all studentify commands. For example, I just edited exercise seven. So list exercises. So these are the exercise. Let me go to exercise. Exercise seven events. Okay. So now I am pointing to that particular exercise. And uh, if you look for a student, so this is the file basically. So we asked, uh, so this is right now in Scala 2 syntax. So we asked, uh, like after learning the .t syntax, uh, we asked the students to convert it with the Scala 3 syntax. I forgot yeah. to pull yeah. the solution. It's actually good. Yeah. Day. Yeah. Good. So now if you pull, pull solution, it will pull the solution for that. And it overrides with the change, which I already applied to my master repo. So the students now have the latest changes. So this is uh, a basic uh, workflow which we follow uh, while maintaining this course. So I think uh, that's a small demo of this linearize and relinearize, and that's it. Right. So here we are. So a few remarks uh, maybe to to add to to what uh, what Robin just uh, told you. Uh, that is that in this flow, obviously um, you would you know would not wouldn't go as smooth always as we as uh, as as it went with uh, with the demo. Um, of course, you would do testing here and you know continue to change until uh, your exercises uh, properly con uh, function, and then you would do the do the delinearization. Um, Okay, so that was linearized, delinearized. Maybe a remark about, you know, which one do you choose? So in principle, if you don't master the, you know, interactive rebasing, you could do all these changes directly on master. But obviously, in some cases, that would be a lot of work. Now, uh, a lot of the changes can be applied using direct modification of the master. Like, for example, you wouldn't want to change a readme file in some exercise uh, via interactive rebasing because you will certainly have to resolve a merge conflict uh, immediately on the next one, okay? It's a, it, it doesn't make sense. So in some cases, it's way faster to do that uh, directly than using interactive rebasing. And that takes uh, a, a, a while to learn, um, you know, what which approach is actually the, the, the optimal one, but it's, you know, you can just experiment and um, if you find that some approach is too difficult, then you basically, uh, for example, if you went this route, then you discard the artifact and you do whatever you need to do here or vice versa. And, you know, you can also delinearize many times uh, that will just result in changes that you can potentially already commit and then later on squash them together, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a it's a relatively useful um, workflow. Um, actually, um, in practice, it turns out that um, the linearized repo has actually more use cases. And for example, if suppose someone would like to start teaching the course that we just built, and they're studying the exercises, they might want to have a quick look, for example at what are the differences uh, between the different exercises. And you can uh, use the linearized repo exactly for that because, because it's, uh, it's basically all the exercises in sequence uh, in subsequent commits. 
So then you load, for example, this repository in uh, into uh, a tool like source tree, and you can just expect step inspect step by step what are those differences. Um, the tooling is called course management tools, but actually it's used for other purposes. Like for example, you want to build a demo and you want to uh, show how it's built up step by step, then you can do exactly that. You build it like you would build an, a normal exercise um, repository, but you use it for demo purposes. Uh, proof of concepts, even uh, the same thing. Um, also, when you're doing a demo or you're showing a, a POC and people ask you questions, actually in the Studentified repo, you can start, uh, you know, if they say, could you do that? You can actually show it live, code it up, and then, you know, using safe state, you can save it for later retrieval, uh, restore the solution and pull the solution and then move on with the next step. And I've also used it at conference talks uh, because you can create aliases for commands that, for example, combine the next exercise with the pull solution so that, you know, you can just say next step, for example, and it moves to the next step with the, with the code for the next step in, in your uh, IDE. Um, there's also a master ADM command that allows you to do some uh, maintenance tasks, like for example, uh, regeneration of the main build file because the root build file is actually um, aut um, you know, built automatically. So you sh normally you shouldn't edit it uh, yourself, but you can regenerate it using the master ADM command. You can renumber exercises, you can delete, duplicate, and uh, duplicate and insert before. You can create gaps. Um, and you can do some limited uh, re repository, master repository soundness checking. So it can check, you know, every exercise should have a readme file. Um, it should need some structure and that's uh, all verified. And then uh, the second to last bullet here brings up an important topic and that is testing. And for testing, uh, you want to make sure, uh, certainly later if you want to like, um, you know, do automatic validation in CI of your course and build artifacts, you can use a uh, master ADM to generate, uh, and I'll quickly demonstrate that, to generate a test script that exercises your uh, studentified artifact like a student would do or could do potentially. So if we um, take um, our screen again uh, here and we can run the master ADM command on our repository. So master ADM, the last parameter obviously is the, the path to our uh, master repository, uh, the dot for compatibility, uh, and we say minus t is generate a test script, and we want to put the test script in the file t in the slash tmp folder. So if I execute that, and I cd here, uh, let's do it here, uh, we cd to slash tmp, we see that indeed there is a file t, and that file T will uh, basically, first of all, test that, uh, verify that all the tests in the different exercises uh, pass on the master repo. And then it will uh, studentify the master repo and then it starts executing commands in that repo. So if we make this um, file executable and we run it, then you will see that it starts plugging away at testing uh, the whole thing. We won't wait until it completes because it, uh, it basically, well, it takes, it takes quite a while, but you will see it starts uh, speeding out uh, results. Um, yeah, and these warnings are actually meant to be there uh, as part of the course. So going back to the to the presentation, if I can find it. 
Uh, where's my keynote? Ah, here it is. I think we're almost at the end. So a few words about what could be next. Um, so, you know, as usual, lots of ideas, but little time, not enough time to execute them. Um, there is quite a bit of uh, documentation on the course management tools website. Unfortunately, it's a little bit outdated, uh, something that may sound familiar to you. Um, but, you know, I have many ideas about new functionality. For example, we could uh, imagine that there would be some form of delinearization from a studentified version of the repo. Why would that be useful? Be it would be useful because you would be able to uh, go to, you know, and, and edit your uh, course as if you were a student and then uh, at some point in time say, okay, now I want to reflect things back to the master repo. Um, and there are more ideas uh, actually. And, you know, anyone who wants to contribute to the project, uh, you know, maybe even become a committer, just, uh, just ping me. And with that, um, I would like to open it up for questions. Um, I can also give a demo of the linearized, delinearized process that is less trivial, uh, where you actually run into a merge conflict. Um, but, um, you know, I'll leave that to you. If, you. if you want me to do that, I can certainly do that. So, voila, that's it. Uh, I would say I will stop sharing now. And... Start the video. Oh. Anyone with uh, questions? I have a question about uh, what you mentioned about how the uh, root SPT file is uh, generated. What do you use to do that? What do you what? Ah, what do you do? That's part of the tools. Huh? It's uh, it's just plain Scala. Uh, maybe I yeah I should have mentioned that. Uh, let me see if I have, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna load the course management tools in my IDE. So I just loaded the course management tool source code into an IDE, this time in IntelliJ. Sorry about that. Uh, but um, you see the different commands, right? And they're all, you know, uh, so here's linearized, for example, uh, it's all pure, uh, pure Scala. But what I do is I use the Scala process API because I execute a lot of commands, uh, stuff on, on in the, you know, the shell environment, let's say. Um, most and more in particular, I, uh, as you may have seen in the output, when I ran the different commands, you see some output from, from Git and I didn't want to use a library that gives me Git, a Git functionality in Scala or Java. Uh, I chose to use the, you know, the systems, uh, the installed Git, because actually in the beginning I ran into problems that I bumped into errors, uh, bugs in Git, and I had to upgrade Git, which fixed the problem. So I used the process API basically to launch uh, Git commands uh, to, to do whatever is needed. Uh, so, uh, generating the master build file, uh, see if I can um, quickly find it. Uh, it's probably here at the top. Yeah, create master build file. <laughs> and it's some plain, you know, string generation and dumping it to a file and, you know, doing uh, string interpolation to put the right stuff at the right place. And uh, the result of that, we can, for example, see here. Uh, so here I'm in the master repo. Huh? So you will recognize the different exercises, uh, the folders that correspond to them. And my build file uh, looks like follow. Okay, like follows. Uh, so some generic intro stuff 
And then this is a definition of a multi-project build. And then you have the different, <clears throat> the different sub, um, you know, the different projects. So it's not more complicated than this one. Does that uh, answer your question, uh, Ismar? Yeah, very cool, thanks. Um, then I would say, uh, unless, uh, would you like me to do the demo of uh, the other um, editing process? We still have some times, time in principle. Um, so yeah, why not? So I'm, I'm here, let's verify first mm -hmm. that I haven't, I didn't change anything. So I'm, I created a branch with, you know, that um, is on a commit that um, was actually right before I applied uh, a change in the, in the code. And um, so I'm now going to try to apply that change, right? And uh, so what I do is, uh, first of all, um, I will linearize the project. So as was demonstrated, so I have an empty folder normally here. Yeah, I will, um, sorry. Um, so I will linearize the project. So here I am, I CD into the folder and I have my, um, my linearized project. So, now I'm going to apply a change and that change consists of, um, so I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna use silver searcher because I'm going to replace occurrences of calls on the behaviors method to receive message partial, I'm going to change it with receive message instead of receive message partial. So what I'll do is I'll, well, I want to apply this change starting from the initial state actually. So what do I need to do is, I, what I need to do is I need to um, do a, an, start an interactive rebasing from the root, right? Because in this case, I actually need to start from the very first exercise. So, okay, now I'm in, I'm on the first exercise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to apply the change in an automatic, in an automated way. So I'm, I've actually, uh, of course this in reality, if you do this, do this uh, for the first time uh, or initially it will take a lot more time. So I'm actually going to launch the same command that looks all the occurrences of this string uh, in Scala files, I want it not to show the actual matched pattern, but I want it to just print the file. And I want it to be the match to be uh, case sensitive. And then for each of the matched files, I launch an uh, in place edit where I do a substitute global substitution of uh, receive message partial to receive message. So if I do that, that's done, right? Um, and by the way, for those who were not on the course, AG is the silver searcher. And as you can see, it's bleeding, uh, bleedingly fast. So I have my project and I've actually, oh, maybe I, <laughs> maybe I should have uh, uh, loaded the project in, in, uh, in Visual Code Studio, but so I'll open up a new window and I'll open up a folder and by magic, it's, it's actually positioned in the right folder. So, voila, the project is, is being loaded. And I'll import the build. I'll close this file. So now let's have a look. So you see, you know, uh, by the way, you see also that uh, because there's only one exercise at a time, there's no exercises folder, but there is only one exercises, literally named exercises folder. And if we go to, you know, one of the uh, 
files that was edited. Uh, I think it was like the Sudoku problem sender, for example. Then you see that there used to be behaviors that receive message, but now uh, message partial, but now it's receive message. So now typically, uh, so now I can do, you know, git status and git diff, and you see that the changes are there. So what I'm uh, going to do next is I'm launching SBT because now I want to verify, obviously, what is the impact of my changes. So, so I need to see that it still works and also that it compiles uh, clean. And we see that we get some warnings, right? And we need to fix them. Now, I'm not gonna, you know, write the code uh, in, uh, in uh, you know, live. Uh, I'm just gonna, I've cut out the pieces that I need to change. So I'm going here and I need to uh, see the, the progress tracker. Boom, 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 boom. I need the progress tracker and I need to uh, basically make changes here, but for the, the sake of saving time, I'm actually going to just copy paste what needs to be changed. And then I'm going to do the same thing in the Sudoku solver. And I go to the Sudoku solver, voila, and it's the idle method. Uh, the idle method is here. And I make the change and I verify. And it compiles clean. Okay, so good. I can quit uh, the SBT shell. I have my changes that I applied. I'm going to add them. And I'm going to do a git rebase dash dash continue. And as Robin said, don't change this message because, because otherwise you will not be able to uh, delinearize because it actually verifies some, some stuff. So I save that. And now I see, uh, you know, that actually it couldn't apply the changes in exercise nine. So, okay, let's have a look at, uh, at the changes in our IDE. And here we see the conflicts. And what actually needs to be changed is that there is a conflicting change. So you see that on the one hand, we have behavior command. It, the other one says it should be command and responses. And here we have received message. And here we have received message partial. So what we need is actually a mix of both. So I know I need uh, this one. And I'm going to. Uh, sorry, I'm going to need this and I'm going to accept the incoming change, but then I need to apply this change. And I'm going to do the same thing here. And I'm going to remove the partial. Okay, so that's one. And then the other one is um, if I switch back here, so we have the problem sender and the Sudoku solver. So the problem sender, here's the other conflict. Uh, same thing, right? Um, so pretty straightforward. I'm going to accept the incoming change and I'm going to remove the partial. And then I'm going to check in SBT that it compiles. And it does. Okay, so good. Uh, I can add my changes and I can continue my rebase. Just save as is and we're done. Okay. We're back to where we were. Uh, sorry, with all the changes applied. And now I can uh, uh, so if we do look in the master repository and we do a status, uh, sorry, uh, git status, we see that we're clean. 
but if we take the, the tools and we delinearize, and we see that um, all these changes, if we do a git diff, you know, we have all these uh, changes that were applied and we're done, okay? And that concludes the talk. And thank you for your attention.